Welcome. In this uh, podcast, we'll look a little bit more deeply into emission spectroscopy. By the end of the podcast, students should be able to explain the significance of quantum yield in emission spectroscopy and analysis using emission spectroscopy. Draw a basic block diagram for an emission spectrometer and explain how the instrument works. And identify fluorophores and predict their relative emission wavelengths. If you recall, emission spectroscopy is the general term that we use to describe those types of spectroscopy in which we probe the light emitted by an excited chemical compound. In our earlier podcast, we talked about two specific types of emission, specifically fluorescence and phosphorescence. And it was the spin allowedness of the LUMO-HOMO transition is what formally distinguishes these two types of emission. Fluorescence is the spin allowed process and it is characterized by very short-lived emission. Recall we discussed emission lifetime and the fluorescence lifetime refers to the average time the molecule stays in the excited state before emitting the photon. The lifetime for fluorescence is relatively short on the order of nano to picoseconds. Phosphorescence, on the other hand, is the spin-forbidden process, and often we're dealing with an excited state triplet returning to a ground state singlet. Phosphorescence lifetimes are comparatively longer than those for fluorescence. The energetics of fluorescence and phosphorescence and several other radiative and non-radiative processes can be visualized using a Jablonski diagram, an energetic diagram such as the one shown on this slide. And in the diagram, excitation produces a photoexcited singlet state, S2, which here quickly loses energy through a vibrational collisional deactivation process, which we call internal conversion, to produce within picoseconds a much more stable, lower energy singlet state, S1. If S1 emits a photon at this point to return to the ground state, singlet state S0, then the emission process would be formally spin allowed and referred to as fluorescence. S1, however, might undergo a change in spin to produce uh, 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 through a slower non-radiative process we refer to as inner system crossing or ISC to produce a single uh, excuse me a triplet state T1 as shown on this slide and if T1 emits a photon at this point returning to the ground state S0 then that emissive process is formally spin forbidden and referred to as phosphorescence. <laughs> If emission is to be useful analytically, then it's important that at least a significant number, if not a majority, of photoexcited molecules emit light rather than returning to the ground state through non-radiative processes. So we often talk about, and will actually measure, a parameter referred to as the quantum yield. And the quantum yield is simply the ratio of the number of photons emitted divided by the number of photons absorbed. And on this slide, the number of photons absorbed corresponds to the difference between the number of photons incident on the sample and the number of photons transmitted. It's important to note that emission is isotropic, and I don't think this is a point I mentioned before. And that means that all the photons of light that are emitted will travel in all different directions. And this is consequences, but also benefit um, that we can take advantage of in terms of the uh, ultimate instrumental design. So the question you should be asking at this point is how does analyte concentration relate to emission, in, uh, emission signal intensity? Is there a relationship that's analogous to the beer lampert law that governs emission? And so what we're going to do on the next two slides is basically derive a relationship um, to show us how emission signal intensity relates to sample concentration. And since it's a relatively straightforward process, we're actually going to go through the derivation together. 
So first what I'm going to do is I'm going to rearrange the equation I showed you on the last slide for quantum yield so that P sub E, the power of the emission, is on one side of the equation. Next what I want to do is express the power in terms of P naught, uh, the incident power, using Beer's law. And you'll notice on the middle I have placed for you another statement, an equivalent statement of the Beer-Lampert law for uh, UV vis spectroscopy. And uh, this one states that the ratio P over P naught can be expressed as um, base E uh, to the power uh, minus epsilon CL, where those terms are, as usual, the molar absorptivity, epsilon, times the concentration C in units of molarity, and times the path length L in units of centimeter. And if we write this expression in terms of P, and we substitute it for P in the rearranged quantum yield expression, we now have an expression that relates PE, or the emission power, to P naught and concentration. So what I want to do at this point is I want, want to think about how I want to carry out the experiment. And if I carry out the experiment in such a way that um, there's not a lot of um, absorbance by the sample, if I um, set things up so that epsilon CL is very small, how small? Uh, let's say um, less than 0.05. Um, so in other words, most of the light is being transmitted through the sample. Then I can expand that um, exponential fun that function base E as a Taylor expansion. And I uh, want to remind you of what it looks like, and so I've given you the first three terms at the bottom of the slide. So now what I want to do is I want to substitute that expression, E to the minus epsilon CL, um, expanded as a Taylor function, and uh, substitute that into my uh, uh, PE expression. And if I do that, and I am highlighting for you here in red uh, exactly uh, what I am substituting and where I am substituting it, um, then I can basically, as long as my absorbance is relatively small, less than 0.05, I can keep the first two terms. And so I'm not going to worry about that third term, even though I've written it into the expression, and I'm certainly not going to worry about the nth term. And then if I look at it very carefully and I expand it, I can cancel out a few terms. And what I'm left with is the expression um, shown at the third bullet point in red. P sub E equals the quantum yield for emission times the incident power times the product of epsilon CL. And so the bottom line here is that the em emission intensity is proportional to concentration as long as um, I don't have the sample absorbing a lot of the light. And so you have to think about how are we going to do the experiment so we can get a significant um, signal uh, uh, P sub E, or um, emit, uh, signal in terms of emitted light. And I'll tell you that one thing that we do experimentally is we actually use a high pressure lamp as the light source in the emission spectrometer. So now I want you to think about with me for a second, what would be the consequence of having a high sample concentration? Well, if we have a high sample concentration, then P is basically going to be approaching zero. And under those circumstances, the emitted light will basically be a constant. I have no concentration dependence. <laughs> so again, you have to be very careful, and your data can actually guide you uh, it, when you're doing an emission experiment in terms of whether you're doing things properly or not. So the bottom line is, if you want concentration dependence for your signal, then it's very important to keep your sample concentration low. All right, so now let's take a look at the block diagram for an emission spectrometer. And a quick aside, I, I want to mention that most manufacturers will refer to their instruments as fluorescence spectrometers. 
um, and uh, they generally do not make any differentiation uh, between phosphorescence and fluorescence as I have uh, been doing throughout. Um, so bottom line is when you see an emission spectrometer, if they refer to it as a fluorescence spectrometer, it's certainly good for studying the phenomenon of phosphorescence as well. All right, so if you look at this block diagram, it looks suspiciously very similar to the block diagram that we had for a UV visible instrument. We have a light source, sends out photons of light of all the colors of light across the spectrum. I typically will <coughs> select out um, certain wavelengths of light that I want to use to excite my sample. So I'll put it in the uh, photo excited state and um, will uh, then allow the sample to emit light. Remember the emission is isotropic. And what I'm going to do here um, gives the instrument its sort of unique geometric shape. Um, I, I want to measure my signal at 90 degrees, collect it with respect to uh, the beam of light that will be traveling through the sample to photo excite it. And that's so that the only photons of light that I'm actually going to end up collecting should be photons that are uh, due to um, the emission phenomenon. So that's very important. Emission is generally collected at 90 degrees with respect to the incident light, and it's done to ensure that only the emitted light is sampled. And I hope that this makes sense to you um, in terms of, uh, of um, the equation that we just derived. I also am going to suggest at this point, it, it might... Um, it, you should understand, therefore, that there's also going to be consequences for that little sample cuvette that you're looking at there. In emission spectroscopy, we typically use cuvettes for which all four sides are optically transparent, not just the two uh, parallel sides as in UV-Vis. Um, so you, uh, fluorescence cuvettes, emission cuvettes, tend to be a tad more expensive and uh, folks who have emission spectrometers tend to be a tad more fussy about students using high qu quality quartz cuvettes with four optically transparent sides. All right, so we photo excite our sample, we collect um, the emitted light, and then we uh, use a monochromator in order to see how many colors of, how many photons of the different colors of light are being emitted by the compound and we use a photomultiplier in order to collect um, that information and turn it into an electrical signal. So that's the basic block diagram uh, for a emission or fluorescence instrument. Now, it actually turns out there are three commonly used geometries, and so I did want to acknowledge this. Um, the 90 degree is the one that i just gotten through speaking about. Um, generally, you have to have a sample that is not strongly absorbing or one that you've diluted so the absorbance is low, and your solutions need to be very clear, um, not have any floating or light scattering particles in them that will contribute to um, stray spurious signals. Um, there is another geometry that you may see used in the emission instrument, and that um, is a frontal 37 degree uh, geometry. This allows users to study concentrated or optically opaque solutions, um, as most of the uh, light basically reflects off of the surface. And uh, lastly, I want to acknowledge it is possible uh, to perform emission experiments in a uh, transmission mode. However, this is seldom used. It requires great care in terms of setting up the experiment properly. The samples must be optically transparent, and again, the analyte concentrations must be kept uh, very, very low. So now let's uh, take a look at the absorption spectrum, which is often referred to as the excitation spectrum in, uh, when you're performing emission spectroscopy, and the emission spectrum that is produced. And if you'll recall, emission always occurs at longer wavelengths, 
and you will typically uh, obtain the strongest emission signal if you excite your sample at lambda max for absorbance. So generally the first step in doing an emission analysis is to actually record the UV visible spectrum and determine what the best excitation wavelength is to use. And once you've determined that, then you, use, you set um, that number in the emission instrument and re record the spectrum uh, for uh, your uh, sample. So now let's uh, talk for a few minutes about the chromophores that emit light. Um, we call those chromophores that emit fluorescence uh, fluorophores. And generally they are pi, pi star chromophores um, uh, that tend to be uh, strongly emissive. Um, there are some charge uh, uh, metal to ligand charge transfer complexes um, that also emit light. And we'll take a look at one of these a little bit later. Fused ring systems with several rings coupled together tend to work really well. And so I've given you a number of different structures. Uh, they can be substituted aromatics. Um, uh, you have furan. Uh, you can use um, uh, nitrogen substituted um, aromatic systems, sulfur substituted aromatic systems and the like. Um, it, as the, you make the pi, pi star uh, system bigger, um, as the size extends, then the pi pi star transition moves to longer wavelengths and concomitantly, the emission wavelength will also shift to longer wavelengths. Geometry can play a, a role in this conjugation effect, and it does. And linear systems tend to be shifted to longer wavelengths compared to nonlinear systems. And so I've given you the structure of anthracene, um, which emits at 400 nanometers, and you can compare that to phenanthrene. Uh, which is nonlinear, and it emits at 465, uh, excuse me, 365 uh, nanometers. And this is a nice point uh, to close our discussion. At this point, it would be good to reflect, and I'd suggest you should be able at this point to explain the significance of quantum yield, define that term in emission spectroscopy, draw a basic block diagram for an emission spectrometer and explain how it works, and identify fluorophores and predict their relative emission wavelengths. And with that, that'll bring this podcast to a close.